Hard work bought this Gucci. I done sold everything but booty. We have a major problem with our church. I may have missed the point, but I'm sure you'll get the hang of it. In fact, we have a lot of problems with our church. Back to kick. We're going to get some emails. Here we go. <laughs> Whether it's a big church. It's just a temple. Syrup all over the communion. Don't care so much. Over the Bible, too. Or a small church. We are not doing our job as a church. When you look across the landscape and you look at churches, you see churches that are doing any and everything, oftentimes, but what they're called to do. Oftentimes, we see churches that have forgotten their first mandate, which is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your being, with all of your fiber. And then in turn, secondly, to love your neighbor, to love your brethren as you love yourself. And we don't see that nowadays. What we do see is a love for self, a love for self-promotion, a love for greed, and a love for money. And it's shown up in the pulpit, and it's shown up in the people that attend. Believe you're blessed. Believe you have favor. When you say, I am blessed, I have favor, I'm coming out of debt. Churches have now become so Sunday focused that they forget that there's six other days that also are important in our lives. Days that could be used to teaching and edifying, not just the youth, not just the children, but also the adults. Whereas the largest part of the building used to be regarded as a sanctuary, it's now regarded as the theater. <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you too. <laughs> are you at church? Yes, we are. Welcome to Saddleback, everybody. What has happened primarily is there has been a distortion of worship. As Moses tells Aaron, whose sons were just consumed by God, because they approached him in an unworthy and unholy fashion, he reminds them that those who will come near me will, I will be treated as holy. I will be regarded as holy before the people. I will be honored. We have forgotten that. We have forgotten to honor the Lord. We have forgotten really what worship is. Hey, 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 you what I say. We treat worship as though it's a glorified talent show, a way to put on a performance versus what it actually means to worship is to come in a bow down sense. It doesn't even really refer to music. It refers to really the kind of tone and the tenor of our heart as we go before him. Understanding that we are fallen creatures who have been redeemed by a truly holy God and we are not deserving. And so we reverence him that way. We treat him that way. Remember, the Bible says that we ought to worship him, obviously in spirit, but also in truth, in a truthful, uh, holy fashion, in the right way, the correct way. Not to say that there is a certain way that we have to do it all the time, but it necessarily means that we have to have sincerity of heart and sincerity of head. In other words, we need to know what we're worshiping, why we're worshiping, and how to worship. That affects how we worship. But unfortunately, for many, worship is just a show. <laughs> Along with distorting worship, we have also in our church, one of the major problems is we have distorted, and I shouldn't even say distorted, we have forgotten what it means to have sound doctrine. One of the qualifications that Paul gives Timothy regarding who elders should be, who pastors should be, is that they must be able to teach according to 1 Timothy 3, verses 2, as well as 3, but they must be able to teach. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of pastors who either aren't able to teach or seem not to have very much interest in teaching, at least with sound doctrine. In the old agreement, you serve him, but in the new agreement, he serves you. Are you listening to me? Those that are supposed to be leading people with sound doctrine have gotten to the point to where they can't even lead themselves. They are distorting even the very nature of Christ. 26, it says, let us make mankind in the image of God. In the image of God, they made him. There's one God, but he manifests himself in three forms. It's gotten to the point to where even pastors, people in the pulpit are now disregarding the Bible. It's just a part of what we're supposed to have, but there's more. So we're not limited to the, to the Bible, but God expands 
That comes by taking the limits off of him and allowing him to expand upon scripture, bring revelation upon scripture. Well, if the word is not important, well, then who determines what's important? Obviously, it's going to be the man in the pulpit and it's going to be according to his feelings. When you hear people say things like this, then you know it's time to leave that church. There are some Christians who say things like, if it ain't in the book, it ain't real. What are you talking about? You mean to tell me you got the audacity to think that everything God wants you to know can only be found in the Bible? You minimize him the moment you try to put your hands on him. That's why the idea of theology or the study of God is so asinine and sophomoric to me. The pride to think that God would sit in your Petri dish to be observed by you. One of the reasons for having sound doctrine, as Paul is telling Titus, is that you must hold fast to these faithful words in accordance with teaching. Why? So that he will be that is the pastor the elder will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. There are a large number of people who have unsound doctrine, as a matter of fact, who are downright blasphemous. And the pastor is supposed to want exhort and teach sound doctrine, but also refute those who contradict sound doctrine. But rather than desiring the word as babes desire milk, pure milk, we have folks that would rather promote a performance, who would rather promote a trick, a gimmick, anything but the word. And coolers can't keep you. And gin and juice won't draw you to God. And Hennessy can't help you. Now pastors go for dramatic effect rather than actual truth of the gospel. And there are even pastors who will say that entertainment is more important or just as important. I really do believe in something that I call spiritual entertainment. Um, I don't believe that spirituality by itself can hold the attention of a person's heart to the degree that they can be transformed. In order for you to hold their attention, you need a level of entertainment. You go to churches now and it's really more of a concert or concert-like atmosphere that we see. And in doing so, they'll also not only give a false understanding of what true worship looks like and what sound doctrine looks like, but they'll also give the impression that you are at a concert and you start hearing things that are ungodly, but because they have a nice beat behind it, you clap and cheer to that. We don't make it rain on booty cheeks. We don't make it rain on strippers. We only reverence one stripper, and that's the one that took off glory. And make no mistake about it, the whole point for this is that these people see the gospel as a means of gain. As Paul says, tells Timothy, he says, with these people, there's a constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprive the truth who suppress that godly, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. What they don't realize, though, that godliness actually is a means of great gain. In other words, our godliness is the game that we're looking for. Our godliness keeps us content. That's what we're concerned about. But just like we see from Simon the Sorcerer, he himself was doing these particular tricks, these magic tricks and so forth. Why? Because he thought he was claiming himself to be great. And then when he saw the true power of the Holy Spirit, what did he want? He wanted to buy it. He wanted to buy it so they can use it. Why? Not to promote the gospel, but again, to promote himself. We've got pastors nowadays preachers nowadays that are more concerned with their own brand than they are with the Bible, more concerned with what they've got going on than they do with the people that are in the pews. Today I'm releasing to my church my first new book in eight years, Do the New You, and you get it first. As Paul Washer says, if you use carnal means, you got to have carnal means to keep them. Because we have dumbed down the gospel, because we're not preaching the true gospel and we are using carnal means to attract people. If you use carnal means to attract men, you're going to attract carnal men and you're going to have to keep using greater carnal means to keep them in the church. You're going to need more gimmicks. You're going to need more tricks. You're going to need more entertainment. You're going to need more high wire acts, more trampolines. I'm actually going to do something. So now we sit in a place where performance has taken the place of scriptures, and that is a dangerous precedent. Remember, the Bible tells us, preach the word in season and out of season. That's all the time. He says to reprove, 
rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Why? Because of what we're seeing now. The time will come when men today, just like today, will not endure sound doctrine. But instead, they will want wanting to have their ears tickled. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. You'll notice that the bigger church, the more popular churches tend to be, not all, but tend to be more skewed towards entertainment, more skewed towards branding themselves, more skewed towards promoting their book, more skewed towards bringing you in and making you feel good. Oh, yeah. When nobody called me on Friday, I don't care. As a matter of fact, you've become so good friends with your vibrator. Now when your girls ask you to go out, you ain't even go. I don't got to go out. I'm good. I'm going to stay at home. And lastly, one of the other problems, the major problems that we have is there is no regard for sin. We all sin. We all have an occasion to fall. But if you tolerate sin, therein lies a problem. And there's no wonder that we tolerate sin because oftentimes we're tolerating sins with our pastors. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says, one, do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. And oftentimes, though, we're not even willing to go that far, even if we have witnesses if there are multiple people coming forward and saying these things are happening, or we might be too hesitant. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all. Why? So that the rest also will be fearful of sinning, not putting him away quietly, not having some sort of private settlement. No, but you deal with him, you confront him openly. Why? So that the entire congregation knows that sin shall not be tolerated. We don't give a wink and a nod to sin. We will help you. We'll work with you. We will pray with you. We'll labor with you, but we don't tolerate it because we don't want to promote it. If you promote it in the pulpit, then you'll promote it in and give a pass to it in the pews. If I'm wrong, if I've done something in error, if I've messed something up, the Holy Spirit and my accountability can correct me. You making a YouTube video doesn't help me. We have a culture today of people who say, well, yeah, I've sinned, but God will forgive me. And so we'll sin again with the idea that God will forgive me. Well, that's a person whose heart is not repentant. If, if everything was true, all I got to do is repent. That's a person who's not grieved and bothered by sin. That's a person who's okay with sin and thinks that God will be okay with their sin too. And so you give the false impression to the body that sin is okay. The assignment of our church, uh, Brad, <laughs> is to reclaim culture for that's the cause right. of Christ. Yes. Right. We can't let the devil have swag and surf. That's right. We can't let the devil have walk it out. Unfortunately, today, God has become not holy, but our homie. I would explain God as the creator, a heavenly father of someone that wants to be in relationship with you, just um, as somebody that's for you, as a friend. We treat him as though he is not as high and as holy as he is, but the Bible is clear. And the problem is we don't have enough Christians who do what Jude says, to contend for the faith. We need people that are going to stand for the word of God, who are going to stand for holiness, who are going to stand for sound doctrine, who are going to treat God as he should be treated, as a holy God, a loving God, but also a God who does have wrath, who's a just God, who comes back with his reward, whether good or bad for the people. And so the problems that we do have in churches, they are problematic, but they can all be fixed. And I would say to anyone who's listening, make sure that you are in a place to where these things aren't happening in your church, but they regard the Lord as holy. They treat his word as holy. They treat the pulpit as holy and they regard their brethren with love. Amen. <laughs>